So today I thought it'd be a good time to revisit the subject of how computer memory works. If you remember from a few previous computer files several years ago, we looked at how we could store information, a single bit of information, in an electronic circuit. So we took the classic NOR gate, we took two of them in fact, that's vaguely an OR gate, and we wired them up so the output of one fed back to the input of the other and vice versa. And then we had two inputs in that could be used to reset or set the output and we had two outputs that were the opposite of each other. And this circuit, if you built it, you can go and watch the previous episode, would be either be set to be one, if this pin was taken one, and you would remember that it had been set, or you could reset it if this bit was taken to be one, at which point it would then go to be false or zero until you changed it. And that circuit would remember a single bit of information. And then we saw how we could build that up and use multiple of them to store lots of information. We gave each one an address and then we arranged them in a grid and we split that address up to refer to the row and column so we could access each individual bit. Now that stores single bits and we can have multiple ones that we can address individually by giving it a binary address. And if we wanted to store multiple bits, all we do is have multiple ones of them, one to store each bit and run them in parallel. So we'll concentrate on using a single bit. But if we look at a normal memory chip, this is a SIM from long ago, but there's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different chips on here that are used to store each of the individual bits that make up a byte. We can build this circuit and it stores a single bit of information, but we're using four transistors minimum to store each bit, which seems a lot. And is there a way we can store it using less? Now this type of memory, is what's called static RAM. Because once you've stored the bit, it'll remember that until the power's turned off. As we said before, we can arrange these into a grid. And so let's say we're gonna store four bits. That's storing one bit, that's storing another, that's storing another, that's storing another. And then we can address them from the row. So this would be row zero, this would be row one. This would be column zero, this would be column one. And then we can refer to each individual cell on there and we could expand that out we could go up to four by four and so on and now we can refer to any of the 16 things by giving it address so zero 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 one 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 zero zero one one zero one to one 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 over here but as we said we need to use four transistors for each of these cells and that's going to sort of set however much silicon we've got that's going to be the limit of how much ram we can get on there unless we can get the size of this down. So is there a way we can build a memory circuit which uses less than four transistors? The answer is yes, but it comes with a problem. The advantage of building uh, static memory like we saw before is that as soon as it's turned on and set, it remembers that until you turn the power off. If you want to reduce the number of transistors used, we have to compromise that and say, okay, we're gonna let the memory forget. We're going to build a memory circuit that inherently is built to forget that the information is stored. And this is what we use inside all computers these days. The memory that you're building will forget what it's stored after about 64 milliseconds. Now, how does that work? Well, the way we do that is by using not just a transistor, but a transistor and a capacitor. So we build each memory cell rather than from four to six transistors, we build them from one transistor and one capacitor. Now, why does that work? What I've got here wired up is an LED uh, resistor just to stop it exploding, or the current getting too great for it to be more accurate, and a switch so I can turn it on and off. And so the circuit is relatively straightforward. We've got a power source, I have a switch, I have an LED giving off light, and I have a resistor, probably 330 ohms there, it's a classic thing. When I close that switch, that light comes on. But let's also modify that circuit slightly so that we've got a capacitor in there. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna wire it up. So we've got zero volts, our return down here. We've got plus five volts here. And we're gonna put the capacitor in parallel with the LED. So we're still gonna have our switch and we're gonna have the LED and the resistor. But alongside that, we'll have the capacitor as well. So let's wire that up and we should see a difference. So when I turn it on now, when I press the switch, the light comes on, when I let go, it goes off. For those interested at home, I'm using a 470 microfarad capacitor here. So we put that in the circuit, and now when I press the button, the light comes on, but when I let go, it gradually dies down. 
click it, and the light dies down. Now what's going on here? Well, the capacitor is a component that stores charge. So as I close this switch, current flows down through the LED, but it also flows into the capacitor and it stores the charge. The charge accumulates between these two plates. So the current flows down here, it lights the LED when I close the switch, but it also flows down and starts to charge the top plate of the capacitor so that when I let go of the switch, the charge can then flow around this to form a circuit. But the charge is only a small amount and it, as we see, it decays over time and it starts to run out. But that capacitor actually stores, whether it's at five volts or at zero volts. If we don't charge it, then it's at zero volts or it's at five volts and it stores that for a short period of time. And that period of time is dependent on the type of capacitor. If I change this for a 47 microfarad capacitor, make sure I get it the right way round, otherwise there might be an explosion. The same thing is happening. As the slow-mo shows, changing the capacitance of the capacitor changes the amount of time that the information is stored for. A larger capacitor stores it for a longer period of time. But we've got a problem. We've got a circuit here which can store information for a short period of time. And the capacitors typically used in dynamic RAM circuits in a computer, the recommendation is that it'll last for about 64 milliseconds uh, or a bit longer. But that's no good. We want our computer to remember things. So how do we get around it? Well, let's look at the circuit again. As I press it, we can see it's decaying. And if I wanted to store that, I could say, well, that's obviously on. I'll press it again, and I'll press it again, and I'll press it again. And every time I press it, it starts the decay process from full brightness again. And as long as I can refreshing what's stored in there and keep pressing the button, then it stays on, and it stays on, and it stays on. And that's exactly what the computer does. Every 64 milliseconds, it looks at that bit of information that's stored on there, works out whether it's a zero or a one that's been stored, and stores it again. And then 64 milliseconds later, it looks at it and stores it again, and on, and on, and on, and on, and so on. So we've got a circuit now that can store a bit of information for a short period of time but we need to refresh it, otherwise we lose the information in there. Actually, this is not that much different from the first computer core memories that were used way back when, when, when you read the information, you destroyed it, so you had to store it back in again. So it has precedent. But we can use this as the basis of a thing, because we can build a capacitor and a single transistor in much less space on our silicon chip than we use four transistors to do it. We store it in exactly the same arrangement. And rather than having a physical switch like I had there, we use a transistor as a switch. So each of our cells will become a, a capacitor which is connected to ground, and we have a transistor, and then we can put them into a grid arrangement as we had before. And again, we can address them as 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 for the row, and 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 for the column. But we have another problem with the static RAM chips that we had before, they stored five volts or zero volts. With a capacitor, as we saw, it's decaying as it's going on. So rather than just having the values coming straight out of the capacitor, you need to have some extra circuits here, which are called the sense amplifiers, which take the value from the bit and convert it to being a zero or one, at zero or five volts or whatever system the computer is using. So we can't just take the value directly like we could before. We need an extra bit of um, circuitry in there to amplify it to the right levels. And the way these are arranged is that you select a particular row of the dynamic RAM circuit. Let's say we want to select row zero one. And the sense amplifiers are then switched to be connected to that. And whatever values are stored in there, let's say we've got 1010, are then sort of read from there and are produced out as the output at the end. And this leads to an interesting property because whenever we select a value from memory in dynamic RAM, we have to copy this through the sense amplifiers and then it's buffered using effectively some sort of static RAM type stuff after that, which means that it takes longer to select a new row than to switch between a different column. So once we've selected a row, so it'd be very quick to switch from reading on this row, column 00, zero to column zero 01, but we'd have to reload the things if we wanted to go and read from row 00, zero column 00. So 
if we can speed things up slightly by reading across the row each time, and actually if you use a CPU cache, you can preload your cache lines by using that. But what we can also do is once we've read this in, we can sort of feed the values back in to refresh our circuit. And this is called dynamic RAM refresh. And you need to build that in. If you're going to use dynamic RAM in your computer, which is what most computers do these days, you need to build that in to your actual system. And there's various ways you can do it. You could do it literally in software. The original Sun One micro workstation actually had code that refreshed the dynamic RAM every 64 milliseconds. There was an interrupt that was fired and it just went through reading the values from each of those locations which caused the RAM chips to update it. Problem with that is if your program crashes, then you can't debug it because your whole memory gets wiped. Um, so these days it's actually usually built into hardware and actually what will happen is after a certain amount of time, 64 milliseconds, the hardware will go through and refresh each of the rows of the dynamic RAM in turn to refresh each of the memory cells as the data that's stored there. Now actually, in reality, you probably won't do it all in one go. You'd stop it regularly and do a row at a time and go through, then you'd start again each of the way through. And there's lots of support built into various chips to do this. There's an interesting thing about this though. When we built static RAM, the data is stored until the power goes off. As soon as the power goes off, then the value is stored. We're using capacitors here and so there's an interesting side effect in that I perhaps can show it with this. I haven't wired this up, but I'm going to turn my light on and charge it. And rather than um, letting go of the switch, I am going to pull the power supply out. And even though there's no power into the circuit, because that capacitor is built at charge, as I remove it, then it still stores a bit of data. And this actually happens in your dynamic RAM chips. If you pull the power, whereas static RAM would forget everything, the dynamic RAM chips store the data for a short period of time. And interestingly, while the dynamic RAM chips manufacturers say you need to refresh it after six, before 64 milliseconds is up, in reality, it can sometimes be a bit longer. I've seen computers where this has managed to stay for over 10 seconds after the power is pulled from machines. And actually one of the, the security risks for computers is that the capacitance changes depending on temperature. So if you get hold of someone's computer and make it very, very cold and reboot it in a particular way, you have a good chance of being able to recover data that was in their memory. So we can start off by putting an AND gate in here connected to that. So now we have, when A in contains zero, what yeah. we're going to do is try and find the peak okay, of these, these values. So actually, we're starting off in focus here, and we've got a value of about 5 million. 